evening, everyone. This is Ivona Korga from the Piłsudski Institute of America. Um, we are uh, here uh, in New York City, and uh, I would like to welcome Professor Beth Holmgren, who, uh, who is uh, with us from Carolinas, right? Hello, yes. uh, Professor Beth. Yes, uh, hello. So um, we are so glad that we can meet together tonight. Uh, in New York, there is a lot of snow, but I understand that in Carolinas, it's better, right? It's better, but we have a lot of deer. Oh, okay. So there is always <laughs> something. Uh, but tonight, uh, it will be a very exciting evening. Uh, Professor Beth Holmgren will talk to us about uh, how interwar Polish musicals abandoned Hollywood for the Warsaw Cabaret. Before I will introduce our guests, uh, I will... Uh, uh, say a few words about the Institute because there's always some people who never visited us yet, and I hope they will. So, um, Piłsudski Institute is a nonprofit organization which is um, uh, very much involved in preserving Polish history and culture here in New York City for the last eight years. Uh, we have a large archives, a library, and art gallery, and anyone can use those materials. Um, can uh, visit us. So we are open. Just have to let us know that you plan to visit us. And uh, you can also use our resources online at www.pirsutski.org. All are welcome, and we will be happy to um, assist you in any questions that you have. So, uh, uh, now let's get back to our guest. So let me say a few words about Professor Beth Holmgren. She is an American literary critic and a cultural historian in Polish and Russian studies. She is a professor and, and chair of the Department of Slavic and Eurasian Studies at Duke University. She is recognized for her scholarship in Russian women's studies and Polish cultural history with a special emphasis on theater. Um, she's the author of uh, many books, uh, but I would like to mention one which is connected with uh, Polish history, starring Madame Modieska on tour in Poland and America. Also, Warsaw is my country, the story of Krystyna Bierzyńska, published in 2018. And there is uh, one more recently published uh, called, it's, uh, where Professor Holmgren is co-author, which is called Polish Cinema Today, a bold new era in film. Uh, I would like to add also that uh, Professor Beth Holmgren is a recipient of the Vatrov Jędrzejewicz History Medal from our institution in 2017. So I'm honored and I'm so glad that uh, she's joining us today. So uh, Professor Holmgren, floor is yours. Please uh, present your lecture. Thank you very much. It's a real pleasure and an honor to be speaking at the Pilsudski Institute again. And I'm so happy to see Ivona Korga uh, leading the Institute higher and higher to greater achievements. So um, I'm very pleased. Now I'm going to try and start my share screen and let's all just say a little prayer. Let's see. Meanwhile, I would like to add that anyone can um, uh, I uh, can ask questions uh, through chat or Q&A and they will be answered uh, after the lecture. Okay. So, uh, Beth. All right, I, I will start and I'm sharing the screen with Zula Pogorzelska. I'll tell you about that in a minute. I remember that a few years ago, before the pandemic, when I was sitting in the University of Warsaw Library's special collections room and perusing an early issue of the glossy magazine Kino, uh, publication focused on film and also theater in Poland between the world wars. And you can see here, this is a picture of me at my desk. You can see the various outlets um, and things that are floating around uh, the magazine. Kino's pages showed me just how hard Hollywood strived to occupy Warsaw and every other city in the world. 
This issue and many others featured full page photos of American movie stars, reviews of newly released American films, and articles about how Hollywood's new studio system had established an assembly line for sorting out talent and marking a chosen few for star development. Kino tracked for me how quickly Hollywood followed the pioneering jazz singer, the 1927 intermittent talkie starring Al Jolson, with the production of full-fledged musicals such as the big broadcast in 1932, and then the canonical backstage musical, what goes on backstage and how people come to go out on stage, of 42nd Street in 1933, which launched the stars of Ruby Keeler and Dick Powell. In some cases, these musicals were transforming radio and stage stars into film stars, but increasingly 1930s musicals debuted new singers, dancers, and comedians freshly finished on the Hollywood assembly line. I want to thank Kino for educating me about American film. In the meantime, Kino also paid attention to Polish film. And here, the young, cash-poor Polish film industry seemed, as, as many critics said, seemed doomed to inferior imitation of Hollywood product during this critical decade of the 1930s, which was a Great Depression, but was also when the talkies took over in film. Producers in Poland needed to make money on each and every movie. Location shooting was imperative because the studios contained such limited sets. And yet, Warsaw was the capital of live popular entertainment in the 1930s and bursting with singing, dancing, comic talents. The best and luckiest of these performers appeared nightly in the city's sophisticated cabarets, where they delivered high-spirited shows of solo songs, pair dancing, and wickedly funny topical sketches. The most popular performers were also invited to rest glamorously on their laurels in Warsaw's few review theaters, in which they could reprise their greatest hits in sumptuous costumes before adoring audiences. Warsaw's versatile cabaret stars had become, to a great extent, Poland's national idols. No one in metropolitan Poland doubted that the bobbed, curvaceous Zula Pogorzelska, who's featured here on the cover of Kino, was the sexiest woman in the nation, as well as a terrific comedian. And no one doubted that, here, I, ah, they're good, that the compact athletic Adolf Dimsha was one of the funniest men and best impersonators on the planet. And here he is shown in, at his most athletic and most bared um, in Stometrów uh, Miłości in A uh, Hundred Meters of Love, a film in which he was he starred. Nor could anyone imagine a more dapper showman than Eugeniusz Bodo, who could not only sing and dance, but also act if he remembered all the lines. Why then couldn't Poland's movie industry harness the immense star power of these idols in film musicals, or as their producers preferred to call them, romantic comedies with music? One short answer is that the cabarets and review theaters were too successful on their own terms. The longer answer, which I'll explore just a bit tonight, I know I'm standing in the way of you and your supper, so I realize I'm very aware of this, um, making sure that I'm engaging you as much as possible. Uh, the longer answer involves several fundamental ad adaptations that took some time. In fact, it basically took a decade in Poland. That is, finding writers and directors who understood how to produce fast-paced comedy plots and compelling characters that held up well on screen for 80 minutes or 90 minutes. Second, encouraging cabaret composers to adapt their songwriting to move forward these movie long plots instead of writing for short sketches and for solo song spots. And third, making sure that directors respected cabaret stars as experienced performers and that cabaret, car cabaret stars were convinced to take films seriously. That is that their fear needed to be allayed that their performances once filmed and edited would not be distorted or shredded by technology. Above all, it is important to keep in mind that until the Germans bombed Warsaw in September 1939, Polish film musicals coexisted with and were measured against the capital's excellent cabaret shows. But I dare to contend that a few, just a few, 
maybe these fingers on this hand. Um, musicals made in the late 1930s competed with the cabaret very well, in large part because they incorporated cabaret elements and stars so effectively. Distinguishing these film musicals as Polish in the broadest sense of that national designation. I want to give you an idea of this evolution by looking briefly at two films in succession. The first, Co mój mąż robi w nocy, What My Husband Is Up To At Night, made in 1934, rep represents a partially successful experiment in improving some of the Polish film musicals uh, acting and entertaining components. My Husband was directed by Michał Baszynski, the most prolific maker of comedies with music. It features six cabaret stars and locates the action mainly in the swank Alhambra, a fictional name given the Adria, which was pre-war Warsaw's premier restaurant and dance floor. The second film I've chosen, the 1937 Piętro Wyżej, One Floor Up, is in my opinion the best Polish film musical ever made. One Floor Up was very much the film child of Bodo, who served as its producer, screen co-screenwriter, hmm, yeah, uh, artistic director and lead actor. Its director was Leon Tristan, whose talent Bodo greatly admired. Henrik Vars wrote the music for its songs and their lyrics were written by the excellent team of Emanuel Schlechter and Ludwig Starsky. So first, let's take your trouble to the, uh, troubles to the Alhambra. And this shows up, this is the kind of montage that Kino would present about an opening film. My husband, and that's what I'm going to be calling this, my husband is initially linked to Warsaw's best cabarets by featuring that institution's most famous director and conferencier, or master of ceremonies, Friedrich Jaroszy. So I'm going to pass from here. If you were just remember, the man in the striped bathrobe is Kazimierz Krukowski, and the man drinking um, small uh, glasses of whatever um, is Michał Znicz, who is the star of the film. All right, onward here. Here is Friedrich Jaroszy. With his lively, handsome face, debonair dress, excellent rapport with the audience, and witty, accented Polish patter, um, you should realize that Jaroszy learned Polish in his 30s, which is no mean feat. Uh, Jaroszy figured as a guarantor of a night of top-notch entertainment. In lieu of rolling credits, this film cleverly positions Yarashi in front of the closed curtain as he would stand in the cabaret, using him to introduce the film and its makers just as he would announce live performers on stage. Yarashi accompanies each introduction with funny comments about the player's height and weight, and I believe he only did this with the male players. So for example, when he was, um, when he was representing Kazimierz Krukowski, he said, nie ten mały gruby Krukowski, ale ten wysoki chudy. Krukowski. So not that, that short, fat Krukowski, but that, that long, skinny Krukowski. He said that over and over and it got funnier and funnier. Uh, Jaroszy completes his readout of the cast by presenting himself as Mr. Pickwick, a, a visitor from London whom Varsovians revere as the king of fashion in this film. The plot of My Husband hinges on a comfortably rich hero's sudden reversal of fortune and his mad efforts to hide this fact from his spouse. The primary lovers in this movie are not young and bland, as often is the case in Hollywood musicals and the earliest Polish musicals, but an established couple, the industrialist Roman Tarski, whom the superb character actor Michał Znicz uh, transforms from order-loving businessman into unabashed schemer, and Tarski's extravagant but still loving spouse, Stefa, played by the very adept actress, Maria Gorczynska. Given that Znicz played on both cabaret and serious stages, and Gorczynski performed on the serious stage, these two could be relied on to form an effective acting team, a real boon to the rollout of the plot. Now, back to that plot hinge. Tarski's plans to redecorate their posh apartment while Stefa is vacationing on the Riviera fall apart when he discovers that his business partner has absconded with all the firm's funds, that none of his friends who are wealthy will make him any sorts of loans, and that he must hunt for work immediately to make ends meet. As he paces an apartment stripped of its new furnishings, his lone resource is the maid, Kasia Fafuwówna. I believe that they made up that name just for me to pronounce for you today. 
and the company she keeps. And Kasha is played by Tola Mankiewiczówna, a cabaret performer renowned for her gorgeous lyric soprano, good looks, and vivacious stage persona. She is, happens to be a very curious and opinionated servant, uh, and notably younger and sexier than Maria Gorczynska, who plays Stefa Tarska. In this case, the female cabaret star's secondary um, casting does not degrade her to a comedic stereotype, as often happened with secondary pairs of lovers in the Hollywood musical. Instead, Kasha strives right forward into the plot and convinces her soon-to-be fiancé, Valery, who's played by Wojciech Gruszkowski, to help her employer, Tarski, join him waiting tables at the Alhambra's nightclub. Kasha is, of course, entrusted with the film's best song because she had the best voice of everybody in the cast, Odrobina Szczęście Miłości, A Bit of Happiness in Love, which became a much reprised hit thereafter. And the words were by Emanuel Schlechter and the music by Jerzy Petersburski. And they were the writers of other, a few other um, songs in this comedy. Soon after Kasha finishes this dreamy song in the maid's quarters, off the kitchen, she, Valeri, and Tarski ease the class tension in the, in the kitchen itself, the symbolic downstairs uh, in a luxury apartment, by polishing off a bottle of cognac and joining in a drunken song about what they might accomplish if they had four legs instead of two. This upper class working class ensemble seems most comfortable imagining themselves linked together in a distinctly non-human species. And here, um, I'm assuming you're seeing this the same way that I am, but who knows? The person who's, who is not wearing a jacket is Nitsch. He's the one who's playing Roman Tarski. And there's, there is uh, Toa Mankiewiczówna playing Kasia. And then next to her is Valery Ruszkowski, who is her fiance to be. Kasia's Valery here trains Tarski, he, the, the shorter man, um, on the job, where the former industrialist works all night serving customers who were once his peers. Muddling Tarski's class status further is the fact that Alhambra's assistant headwaiter, his immediate boss, is Kasha's very protective father, Mr. Fafua. In his review of My Husband, and this came out in 1934, Leon Blum, then editor of the journal Kino, declared that Romuald Gerashensky, the cabaret comedian playing Fafua, bests everyone in the cast in his small role as the irascible fat man, constantly exploding with anger over ever, every misperceived slur on his, his or his daughter's honor. And I'm inclined to agree with Bloom. He is Gashinsky. <laughs> He's basically intimidating Tarski, uh, Tarski's wife, and uh, the person who is chasing Tarski's wife, um, Count Karalescu. But you can see Gereshinsky. I wish I had a, a better close up of Gereshinsky because he's extremely funny and he explodes right on, uh, you know, as if he's been, as if, as if a flip has been switched. The other two cabaret comedians cast in this film, Konrad Tom as the detective who searches the globe for Tarski's fugitive partner, and Kazimierz Krukowski, seen here about to be hit by Gereshensky as Count Karalescu, who falls for Stefa on the Riviera and then follows her to Warsaw, are mired in broadly stereotyped parts that they do little to improve. Tom's, uh, Tom's progress is conveyed by a recurring cartoon of him wearing a sh uh, Sherlockian deerstalker hat with pipe in mouth, gun in one hand, and a leash in another while his dog, his, his bloodhound, sniffs the ground. This cartoon periodically fades into stereotyped newsreel footage, for example, dancing tribes in Africa or a huge crowd of Muslims bowing down to worship in India. For Polish audiences in 1934, such animation to newsreel sequences uh, likely seemed innovative, especially the cartoon. Today they are dated and the newsreel portions embarrass really embarrassingly so. Krukowski, who was most loved in the cabaret as the character Lopek, a lower middle-class Jewish shopkeeper, both bewildered and seduced by a modern Warsaw, here exercises his cabaret endowed freedom to try out a very different role, that of a mustachioed, monocle-wearing, aristocratic Romanian seducer. Don't we all want to play that part? 
The part of, part of Count Caralescu, memorable only for his three comically foiled suicide attempts and his repeated operatic renditions of the Pet Petersburgsky Schlechter song, Lai Pięknieszy Signorina, the most beautiful signorina, might have worked very well in a short sketch. But Kru Krukowski's caricature grows tiresome over the course of the film in which he alone must help Stefa understand why her once adoring husband avoids her questions and just wants to sleep all day. The real star of this film, apart from Gerashensky, if you agree with Bloom and me, is the bedazzling transformative location of the Alhambra. As I mentioned earlier, this set is no Hollywood facsimile, but Warsaw's Adria itself. And this is unfortunately a colorized uh, picture of the Adria with people dancing on the dance floor. The Adria's complex of restaurant, cafe, and American bar, it was called Bar Amerikanski, and the dance hall, which boasted a revolving floor resembling a phonograph record. And if I have to explain phonograph record, those are the discs, those big discs that your parents and grandparents used to use to play record, to play music on. This was widely regarded as the most elegant entertainment establishment in the capital. Studios with limited budgets were thrilled to be able to use its different venues as sets. Almost half of my husband was filmed in the Adria, either in its dance hall, that was very obvious, or in the back rooms that were reserved for private parties and what I would probably say nookie nookie. The filmmakers also advertised the Alhambra as an international venue. Though they could have hired local singing and dancing pairs to perform a number on the revolving phonograph parquet, they instead, and this is very interesting to me, they engaged a Jewish American team who sang in English and featured a male dancer who showed off markedly black jazzy breakout moves and borrowed the jazz band leader's baton to whip up the band into real swing. Here's an example, this is, this is one of the dancers. It is intriguing that in a musical comedy in which no star's Jewish identity is marked, and that included Znitsch, Tom, and Krukowski, this imported American team, uh, team of Miriam Kressen and Jaime Jacobson, who's featured here, uh, primarily performed in Yiddish language theater on both sides of the Atlantic, and just happened to be touring Poland when this film was underway. In any event, their authentic uh, American English and jazziness bestowed a world-class imprimatur on the Alhambra. And this is amazing. He is a good dancer. And you can see that revolving phonograph with the circle that's supposed to uh, basically hypnotize you. The Alhambra also provides a transformative space for the characters to drop their inhibitions and put on new masks or be unmasked. Examples abound. When Tarski arrives late for work at the Alhambra, he simply replaces the tuxedo coat that he forgot to put on at home by swiping Mr. Picnic's finer model when he helps the Londoner remove his coat. Remember, Friderik Yarashi is playing Mr. Picnic. And so, without noticing his state, here it is Yarashi standing there boldly um, in a relative state of undress in white shirt and vest. Soon all the male patrons think, oh, he's the king of fashion, and they begin to doff their jackets to emulate him. And also, Tarski begins running around almost in a kind of a Harpo Marx move from, the, from 1930s pictures, begins to use scissors to cut off the backs, the tails of these coats. In another instance, Kasha, all dressed up and waiting for Valeri, behaves as an entitled patron rather than a maid on her night off. When Tarski, her employer waiter, talks furtively with the girl to avoid engaging with Count Karalescu and his wife Stefa, who are sitting at the other edge of the floor, his wife Stefa immediately suspects that the dolled up Kasha is the reason for her husband's fatigue. Yet once the key players move to the Alhambra's discreet back rooms, they end up preventing rather than pursuing any, illicit, any sort of illicit romance. The film carefully steers clear of any glimpses of seduction. Tarski ultimately confesses the awful truth of their poverty to Stefa. Stefa declares her love for him regardless, and Tom, the private detective, miraculously appears at their back room's door at that very moment with the stolen funds uh, stuffed inside his coat so that both confession and declaration are moot. 
The older primary couple are re reunited by their love for each other rather than the money they almost lost. And they imply their equality with the young working class, Kasha and Valeri, when all four join in a champagne toast, along with the detective Tom and Count Karalescu in the middle. And there is Romold Gereshinsky looking, looking at his daughter and waiting to explode, but he's drinking so you know, perhaps we can be spared, though it would be nice if he did. At the Alhambra, both couples find their happy end and the movies are treated, moviegoers are treated to not one, but three entertaining shows. The first performed by bona fide Americans on stage. The second at the expense of a foreign dandy and his upper class sycophants on the dance floor. And the third backstage where the lovers at first scheme and squabble, then reconcile and finally join together in celebrating their good fortune. All in all, my husband represents an ambitious improvement on its Polish predecessors. Now let's move on to Piętro Wyżej. Let's go upstairs. As I implied earlier, the success of One Floor Up, and here is a classic picture of Bodo, a Bodo headshot. I have to give you that. Um, the success of One Floor Up stemmed in large part from the many talents of Bodo, his skills as a performer, his artistic and managerial control over this particular film, and his collaboration with other excellent artists whom he selected. Bodo was the rare cabaret and review theater star who absolutely thrived in film. He had 31 films to his credit between the wars. Bodo's death in a Soviet labor camp in 1943 put paid to any post-war film career. The young Bodo had been raised literally in the entertainment business. His Swiss father, Theodore Junot, was an engineer fascinated by cinema in its infancy and chose to make a living exhib exhibiting moving pictures uh, throughout the Russian Empire in the 1900s. The cinema smitten Junot, this is the father, eventually settled his business and family in Wuj, the economically thriving Polish Manchester in 1907, where his new theater, dubbed the Urania, combined moving pictures with circus and review shows. Predictably, Bodo grew up addicted to the stage, though his father and Polish mother really wanted him to pursue a career, a respectable career in medicine. I mean, what were they thinking? He ran away in his teens and made his theatrical debut in Poznań. By his early 20s, he had become a promising star in Qui Pro Quo, the best Warsaw Polish language cabaret of all time, and subsequently Morskie Oko, which is called the um, Kiproko is just Kiproko in English. Morskie Oko is the sea, the eye of the sea, but it also refers to the lake uh, down in the Tatra Mountains. And this was the capital's best review theater at the time. Kiproko trained Bodo how to perfect his performance skills and comic timing and establish a knowing connection with his audience, even as he incarnated a quite separate character on stage. Morskie Oko, under the direction of song and sketch writer Andrzej Wast, was much less concerned than Kiproko about the originality and local topicality of its material, and most intent on delivering a splashy show about the metropolis and its celebrities in the tradition of the Casino du Paris or the Ziegfeld Follies. At Morske Oko, Boro grew accustomed to being the star attraction, a handsome leading man dressed in a tuxedo with his mop of dark hair swept back from his brow and, and of course, gelled so that he could keep it back, um, projecting tremendous sex appeal and a showman's grace and largesse. The hit songs he performed were at first those that Vost stole and translated from Parisian reviews, and subsequently those composed by Hendrik Vars. And here is a headshot of Hendrik Vars when he's young, um, another artist whom Vost shrewdly recruited for his big stage. To a great extent, Bodo and Vars' experience at Morske Oko not only cemented their friendship and initial creative partnership, but also prepared them for their respective leading roles in film as durable screen idol and pre-war Polish cinema's most prolific ingenious composer. Given Bodo's longevity, popularity, and earnings in film, the movie star was able to retrace his father's path as an enter entertainment entrepreneur, founding the studio Urania Film in 1933. Bodo was the first and only interwar Polish actor to produce at least a few of his own films. 
In his role as this movie's producer, Pietro Vige, or uh, uh, One Floor Up, Bodo assembled the cast and other creative talent he most preferred. After working with the inventive Vars in such films as To Lucina Tojevcina Is Lucina a Girl, and Pieszczek Warszawy, uh, the singer of Warsaw, both of them produced in 1934, Bodo was especially keen for his favorite composer to produce and arrange the songs for this new film, which openly celebrated jazz. War Vars wrote one substantial and two enduring hits for One Floor Up. In addition, he cleverly overlaid the, his jazziest number, which is called in Polish, Sex Appeal, over Antonin Dvořák's humoresque for the purposes of the plot. For the role of his starring character Sardonic Pal and Foil, Bodo chose Ludwig Sampolinski, a friend from his early years on the Warsaw stage and a well-known cabaret performer, and somebody who wrote a very, very detailed memoir about what played when um, in which theater. His character's love interest was played by Helena Grosuvna, a relative newcomer to the capital. Grusovna had trained as a ballerina in Paris, had mastered grotesque dances that integrated stunning acrobatic moves in Poland, and was a featured player in Warsaw's best cabarets by the mid-1930s, so rather late. Once she debuted in films, and this is Grusovna's obviously the one in the dress, well in this case, yes, Grusovna's slim athletic build vivid features and relative obscurity allowed her to pass as much younger heroines than her contemporaries. She's actually only four years younger than Bodo, but um, in other cases, she's with other people and she is, she's seen as a 19 year old, although she's 30. Um, we should all be so lucky. But what most enabled Grosuvna uh, to pass, uh, to, what most enabled her string of film successes from 1937 until 1939 was her quick adaptation to the demands of film as a medium. Grosuvna not only knew how to move her body for the camera, but she had also learned how to project rapt attention and ardent enthrallment, the sort of still expressions that hold the viewer's gaze, especially if one performs the part of the silent female lover. And I'll show you this, this particular, um, this feat of hers in a, a picture in a moment. In One Floor Up, the primary lovers are Bodo as Henrik Ponczak, and Grosuvna as Loja Ponchkovna, but they are not close relatives. They meet by accident because Loja, on her first visit to Warsaw, mistakes Henrik's apartment for that of her paternal uncle, Hippolyte Ponchek, who's played by Yusuf Orvid, um, because it, the young man's door is the only thing that has an identifying card. It has a business card with his, his the initial of his first name and his surname. So she assumes since there's nothing on her uncle's door and here Henrik is advertising himself, she decides that that's where her uncle is. The young woman has no prior, no, no prior knowledge of the ongoing feud between these two unrelated uh, temperamentally antagonistic Ponchiks. I'm not gonna say Ponchki because that's not correct. Hippolyte, an elderly landlord who cherishes order and the old days, likes to play the most tedious repertoire of classical music in an amateur quartet of, of, with, with three other people who are as sort of dated and daughtery as he is. In vivid contrast, the zany mercurial Henrik, played by Bodo, who earns a living as a radio announcer, mainly enjoys rehearsing with and writing songs for his jazz group in hopes of someday performing in public. The more Hippolyte, the old man, longs to evict the chaos creating Henrik, the more Henrik determines to entrench himself. Hippolyte lives to be outraged, while Henrik lives to provoke. And here is an example of the provocation. You can see uh, here is Hippolyte who's come up with his umbrella. <laughs> hoping to stave off this jazz band that's that's constantly performing and telling them to pipe down and they attack him with sound and you'll see the person who is in the corner playing the piano that's Henrik Vars and he's dressed up to look like Groucho Marx of the Marx Brothers with a grease paint mustache and with his hair looking like Groucho Marx and with glasses like that but I don't know how many whether Henrik Vars appeared in other films I think I'd have to check on that but that would be interesting Let's return now to Loja, who's standing in front of Henrik's place, not Hippolyte's place. 
A resourceful and modern young woman, Lodja discovers an extra key to what she thinks is her uncle's apartment under the hall carpet. And so she simply lets herself in, awaiting her relative's return. When Hendrik rolls home drunk, wearing a fez and depositing a live goose he won in some contest on the piano, Lodja is indignant rather than frightened, and then amused when Hendrik begins to break various vases and ashtrays to disprove her claim that he is in the wrong apartment. He said, why would I destroy these things if this was not my apartment? Um, the two fall in love with each other after Hendrik, and here is, here is that rapt gaze uh, that Grusuvna has perfected. Um, they fall in love after Hendrik plays her a song that he wrote, and she clearly adores. The lovely Loja shares neither the mediocre taste nor the cranky temperament of her uncle, and she can match Hendrik quip for quip, prank for prank. That Hendrik is impetuous, uninhibited, and prone to fall madly in love with a woman or a song or a crazy act of provocation equips him to be an excellent lead in a film musical. Bodo's character possesses what scholar Martin Sutton defines as the key qualities of a musical's protagonist, that is, the romantic rogue imagination and its daily battle with a restraining, realistic social order. Jane Foyer, who is my favorite scholar on the musical, expands on this liberatory function. Musicals are unparalleled in presenting a vision of human liberation which is profoundly aesthetic. Part of the reason some of us love musicals so passionately is that they give us a glimpse of what it would like to be if we were free." Unquote. Indeed, in two cases, Vars, the composer, equips Henrik to create his own buoyant soundtrack, though with unseen orchestral accompaniment. Henrik is first so prompted when he discovers Loge's clue about her feelings for him. Specifically, her revisions of the song title, this is on his own sheet music that he scribbled out, to indicate that its protagonist will love the same woman day after day. Hendrik's title had been, uh, I will love one person, one, one woman one day, and then another woman the other day. And she says, she writes, Jishai ta iutro ta. And he had said, Jishai ta iutro tam ta. After Hendrik pounds out and sings the new version on the piano, he takes to the crowded Warsaw street, singing the song loudly, walking swiftly to its rhythm, and pushing other pedestrians on the sidewalk out of his way so he can maintain both the rhythm and the rush of ecstasy that the music gives him. And I have to confess that I have liked to do this kind of thing myself. I like to just sing something and just move right through a bunch of people. The camera, loaded on a truck bed or a very long dolly, keeps pace with him, coursing through what seems to be an authentic crowd, uh, with some boys in the background running along so they can stay in the movie shot. In a similar fashion, Henrik cannot refrain from sharing the thrilling news of his impending first date with Loja while he is on the job as a radio announcer, even though his boss has already warned him against sharing personal messages with the public. As Henrik announces upcoming events by the hour, he suddenly puts down his new sheet and flips easily into a song about his schedule. And this is Umuvivum Chesnyo na I don't know if, if any of you know this song, um, or you may have heard your parents or grandparents um, sing this song. It's a song also that um, is played in the pianist, uh, um, Roman Polanski's film as sort of a, a harking back to the interwar period, but it's a beautiful little song. Uh, and this is a lovely light number that Bodo confides to the big studio microphone and embellishes with just a few hand gestures. There's no jumping up and running around and using props. He just sits there and sings. When the boss rushes into his cubicle, he does not fire Hendrik, but compliments him on his fine voice and invites his band for an audition on the radio. The success of both of these unorthodox numbers relies on Bodo's particular talents. In the street scene, his fame as well as his showmanship helped clear the way for his music-driven passage down a crowded Warsaw sidewalk, though credit is due his director for resisting any conventionalized setup in which the singer stops and crowds surround him. Instead, Tristan uses the camera to convey how an ordinary man in love strides along in his private bubble of music accompanied happiness. Henrik's sudden song about his anticipated date with Loja works so well because of Bodo's emotional openness, spot on diction, and gestural restraint. This scene qualifies as a little gem of a cabaret sketch.
The other enduring musical hitch in One Floor Up, which is Sex Appeal or Sex Appeal to Nasza Bron Kobieca, uh, Sex Appeal is Our Defense as Women, constitutes one of the most famous performances in Polish film to date. It takes place during a masked ball where guests dress in costumes ranging from giant animal heads atop for, placed atop formal suits to Hippolyte, remember Hippolyte, Loja's uncle, Hippolyte Ponchek's unfortunate yet highly appropriate choice of a knight's armor. A master of ceremonies then suddenly announces in this, this completely chaotic scene that Henrik's jazz band will be the evening's feature entertainment, at last performing in full the tune of sex appeal that they have been rehearsing so long, Pientro Vige, in the room, the, the floor above. Missing in the rehearsals we have viewed in the film was Henrik's key role as singer. Scholar Sebastian Jagielski thus describes Henrik Henrik's stunning reveal. And I'll show you here. Ta-da. And now our evening's a star attraction, our lovely national version of Mae West. The curtains part and she appears, a star with oversized female attributes. Everything in her image is too large, intense, and expressive. She is dressed in a close-fitting evening gown, a satin number that highlights her curves, mainly her monstrously large bust. All her female attributes have been hyperbolized. Jagielski notes the different global valences of a May West impersonation in the 1930s, that West was rumored to be a drag queen, a man in women's clothing, and had emerged as an important symbol of inclusiveness in gay male clubs from Berlin to New York City. The Polish, the Polish scholar also argues that Bodo's costuming and performance as Mae West secretly signals his own homosexuality. I don't know whether it's anything is secret about this, but, um, and I'm not saying that Bodo is gay or, or, or um, bi or anything. I'm just following Jagielski's argument. Um, a revealed self-portrait that would be clear and gratifying to the initiated and a comic romp for the general public. This performance continues after the show and offstage, when, when Hendrix May West bewitches and then humiliates an adoring Hippolyte, his longtime opponent who is literally encased in a construct of old-fashioned masculinity. And here's a picture of him flirting with Hippolyte. And he says, he says, I can't, I can't, you know, I can't get these things because it's <laughs> some Within the context of this film, however, Henrik's astonishing impersonation of a big woman playing an alternately brazen and affected coquette. And in his performance, he doesn't do any imitating of Mae West's sardonic delivery and her stagey burlesque poses. This represents his greatest, most layered act of provocation. Up to this point in One Floor Up, he has sung about his feelings of being in love with a certain girl. Henrik's sex appeal is much more aggressive. It's a complex number in terms of its mixed message, uh, persona, and singing style. This song equates masculine strength primarily with violence, a punch, a slap, intimidating size, and women's power with their grace, style, charm, and chic. Yet the singer drawing these equations and arguing for the weaker sex's greater strength underscores the sheer performativity of her sex, I'm putting in quotes, because Henrik's large, obviously cross-dressed body and emphatic, fast-paced singing indicates otherwise. His incarnation of Mae West seems capable of pulverizing anyone who might disagree with the argument of her women's manifesto. Furthermore, Henrik crosses another line of identity, accompanying his band's final instrumental refrain with markedly black scat singing and exclamations. His bravura performance indulges in the transformations that the innately liberatory transgressive qualities of early jazz seem to afford all of its performers, crossing conservatively defined binaries of gender, sexuality, and race. But it is so important to point out that Henrik's performance, let me go back to uh, a less smudgy picture, that Henrik's performance also smuggles a cabaret bombshell into a film musical that leaves the viewers longing for more. In fact, after this, the rest of the film is, is very well made, but an anticlimax. One Floor Up literally showcases one of Poland's greatest cabaret stars delivering his most challenging magnetic stage number on screen. 
Suddenly, the madcap Henrik in love is unveiled and unleashed as Bodo, the magnificent provocateur and showstopper. His star turn as drag queen is thrilling, threatening, virtuos virtuosic, and really funny. This number barrels in from the cabaret, where cross-dressing was a staple source of edgy sexual comedy, as was the ability to incarnate a famous celebrity on stage. For example, when Zula Pogozelska mimicked Marlene Dietrich from The Blue Angel, or Adolf Dimscha parodied the wildly self-aggrandizing operatic tenor Jan Kipura. In consequence, Bodo's performance as Mae West proved to be too good to be relegated to film and wasted on a mass audience that might not understand it. Five months after the premiere of One Floor Up, the best Warsaw cabaret in business in 1938, and it was sort of an heir to Kiproko, this was Cyrulik Warszawski or the Barber of Warsaw, this cabaret had engaged Bodo to reprise his daring sex appeal number before live appreciative theater goers who welcomed him with thunderous applause. It's in, in, in essence, he was going home and performing it for the people who would best understand it. In closing, I reiterate that it is impossible to fully appreciate One Floor Up and several other musicals made in the late 1930s without understanding the interaction between filmmaking and sophisticated cabaret performance in interwar Warsaw. While the first Polish film musicals tended to parallel those of Hollywood with primary and secondary pairs of lovers and plots that reconcile class and generational differences, the most interesting later Polish films mainly provide the best conditions, that is screwball characters, um, Bodo is definitely playing a screwball character all the way through this, and Loja is attempting to do that, though she's not given enough lines, or they will give jazz the, the these, these later musicals will have very jazzy numbers or they'll have nonsensical dialogue that is extremely funny. And these kinds of conditions allow talented stars to romp easily with each other at an upbeat pace. The insurmountable difference implied in these musicals does not privilege either class or political stance or ethnicity, but instead it elevates cabaret qualified charismatic show folk over everyone else. Unfortunately, this artistically exciting interdependence between stage and screen was literally destroyed by the two-pronged invasion of Poland in 1939. The Nazis' prosecution of the Holocaust murdered the vast majority of the acculturated Jews who remained in Warsaw and primarily had formed the foundations of the film and entertainment industry. Znicz, Schlechter, Wast, Kristan and Arthur Gold were just a few of several thousand such victims. And others, people like uh, Tom and um, I'm thinking of, Petersburg, no, Petersburg came back, but were not allowed back because they had been with the Anders army. Um, as Bodo's death in a labor camp examples, the Christian and Jewish directors, writers, performers, and musicians who fled into Soviet held territory also suffered, albeit to varying degrees. If we are to assess the surprisingly rich popular culture that arose in interwar independent Poland, then theater and film historians today must attempt to reconstruct what so many talented Polish, Jewish, and Christian artists succeeded in creating and fine-tuning together on stage and on screen before their exceptional collaboration was decimated. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Homgan. It, it was really exciting to hear the story about these two great movies and about all actors and actresses and stars of Warsaw. I think we can uh, choose to uh, close sharing and uh, chat, yes, and chat. I with did it, I did it. <laughs> yes, you did it. And uh, chat with uh, our public. Uh, we have a few questions. Uh, so um, um, maybe uh, I will start with um, my own and then give a uh, voice to the public. Um, as we all know, uh, Warsaw was called uh, uh, North uh, Paris of North or uh, was compared to Paris because of the musicals and all that uh, cabarets. Would you agree with that? And do you think it was really significant? Uh, and uh, that what was happening in Warsaw in 1918, 1939? Um, I would say, well, cabarets um, slowly formed because, you know, uh, I mean, coming out of the war, Poland, 
Poland had not been so much invaded as, as depleted and people were hung, going hungry. It was, Warsaw was a, a place that was still very much suffering from the conditions of starvation and lack of work um, in 1918. But there were cabarets going that, that had started up during the war uh, and they were very interesting laboratories. So I would say actually that the cabaret in Warsaw, it never was sort of the, the Chat Noir, the Black Cat, uh, the, the first Parisian cabaret. It was never artist cabaret for artists. It was always a commercial venture. But in Warsaw, particularly, and also in Wuf and in Wuj, there are other cabarets, and there were cabarets that were both Polish language and Yiddish language, but they often were, they were, they were excellent. I mean, there was a level of excellence in those that were the best because they had such great writers and they had all these young people kind of converging. And as I say in, in other, other things I've written, that it was a convergence often of young people who were born at the turn of the century who came, they were either middle-class Jews who for, you know, to their parents were slumming in the cabaret and they said, no, I found my place, or they were working class Gentiles uh, or Gentiles who could not make it on the operatic stage or in other cases because they were too short, um, who came together and they were all eager to play with each other. They wanted to do anything. They wanted to anything that, that was written. And so there was an excitement about this, a kind of unleashing of playing and, and they were extremely talented people. It was just, it was a very special moment in history. And what I find particularly interesting, I, I don't know Paris cabarets as well. I would, of course, say that Warsaw cabarets were better. Of course I would, right? But um, I, I would say that this, this mix of Jewish and Gentile players uh, and happy collaboration, it was not affected by the National Democrats at all because a lot of them went to the review theaters and there were sometimes there were sometimes demonstrations, but they weren't boycotted because there were no other cabarets to go to. These were the cabarets that people so so they stayed. Their only their only enemy was the fact that they may not have had enough money to pay people or that the stars asked for too much money, but they were not ever closed politically. So they continued to operate. And, and that kind of operation, that kind of continuation can only mean that you refine your talent or you do something innovative. And for example, Kiproko, which I mentioned, was a cabaret from 1919 to 1931, which is incredible that it would stay open for 12 years. That's incredible for cabaret. So that's a long answer to your question. And I don't know Paris well enough, but I would, you know, my, my money's on Warsaw. Warsaw. Thank you, sounds really good. So we have uh, questions. First question, uh, actually there are two questions from uh, Edward Mohelovsky. Uh, first is, uh, where, uh, where were those film made, Warsaw, Wuj, or Edsworth? And he's also asking, is Pietro Vijay available on the uh, internet somewhere? Yes, um, first of all, to answer the first question both, Samoy Monge, Robiev Nozzi, and Pietro Vigier are both available on, on, on YouTube, but they are not available with subtitles. Um, and so for me, it was wonderful, but I can imagine other people, you can see, you can see what's happening, you can hear the songs. Uh, Pietro Vigier, I'm, I've been looking for one, there may be one with subtitles that you can buy as a DVD. I'm hoping that Finoteca, which is, um, there are a lot of people who are big fans of 1930s films who work there, and they have a special web, they have a special site on Facebook. Um, I think it's called, or no, it's a website. It's called um, Stare Filme Polske. I think that's what it's called. Um, they write about it, they talk about it, and they are very much in, into the co conservation of those. Now, the first question was, I think uh, most of the films were filmed in Warsaw, but they might have been filmed elsewhere, wherever they could get. I mean, for example, another great musical, which I'm not so crazy about because I, I think it's very well written and I think it's, it's extremely well composed. It's another Vars composition, Zapomniana Melodia. Uh, I'm not a fan of Zabtinsky, I'm sorry. Um, he was a heartthrob for other people, but that movie was filmed in Warsaw and it was also, um, it was filmed in the countryside somewhere where they could actually do kayaking. So, but, but this always involved everybody getting on a bus 
and, and going there and them trying to finish the shoot as fast as they could. So it was a real problem. They did not have the spacious kinds of sets that the studio system had, and that was a shame. Um, I do think that there were some movies produced in Wolf, but I don't know exactly where. I don't know whether, you know, what the studios were, the studio situation was. Uh, the other problem for films, as, as Sheila Scaff um, points out in her really wonderful book about interwar Polish film, is that the there were tremendous problems plaguing nationwide distribution of film. And that was another problem. So this production of making money on every movie you make is, is sort of crazy. I mean, anybody today would say you can't sustain that kind of film industry. And if you can't get it out to the public, it's a real problem. Thank you very much, Bev. Uh, uh, this answered the question. We have uh, a few more. The next one is by uh, Ronald Landa. In my research, I have came across a few Americans who were performing in Warsaw nightclubs and cabarets in September 1939 and uh, were able to escape the country. You mentioned two, Amer you mentioned two Americans who earlier were touring, um, touring Europe and came to Warsaw. How mm -hmm. common were American musicians, dancers and singers in Warsaw during 1930s? That's an excellent question, and, and I don't know the answer in terms of how many, um, but, but I do know that there was a kind of, it was interesting because it was more of a, it could be a transnational cabaret uh, in, um, there were cabarets like uh, Azazel, was Azazel in Warsaw? Yes, Azazel was in Warsaw, I think, because they had the Azazel Shimi. But these were Yiddish language cabarets that in a sense modeled themselves after Kiproko, and uh, they were written, the, uh, Moshe Brodison was the main writer for um, those. He was in, oh, my memory is failing. Um, he was in Wut. And, but, but there were others that, that, you know, there were other Yiddish language cabarets. Uh, and, and there were also Yiddish language films that were being made. Um, um, Yusuf Green, who be, or, uh, Greenberg, who became Joseph Green when he came to became producer director of several, you know, about four or five films in uh, Poland. He also he he would bring in Molly Picone, who was a very famous uh, Yiddish language actress on Second Avenue in New York, and he brought her in as the star talent that would bring that would make people pay attention to a film. And so Molly Picone would be in the film and then there would be people who would come in and do the dancing and singing or playing the peasants or playing whatever the people in the shtetl. So um, the case of Miriam Cresson and Jaime Jacobson may be typical, uh, but I know that Jacobson saw lots of opportunities in Poland and, and they went back and forth. Miriam Cresson was herself a Polish Jew who was born in Białystok and then she left when she was a kid and moved to America. Uh, and then she came back and she was more of an operatic singer, but you know, she was, she was Americanized. So they just said, she's American, you know, put her on, it'll be great. Right, so we have some Americans, we have some Americans coming and even the famous one. Yeah. Uh, now we have one more question uh, from St Stash Kmiech. The cabaret scene was Paris, Warsaw, Berlin, and Bohemian enthusiasts traveled to each location on a tour to experience the riches and the uniqueness of each. But this was Spielmann also played in the cabarets. There is Mira Zimiska and Hanka Ordonka. Please let us about some other star performers. Other star performers who traveled uh, um, the circuit? This I, I cannot answer, but probably question is uh, if, if there, there were any other stars and uh, yeah, the answer oh, is- Oh yes, there were, there were many uh, stars. I mean, what's fascinating to me about the cabaret is that uh, <sighs> male stars often wanted to, to sort of toggle between the cabaret and film. And most cabaret artists looked down on film because they said we're not in control and that what we see is very slow, very, very stodgy. It's not doesn't have the it doesn't it, it just doesn't have the improvisational wit and quickness that we need. But some what's what's fascinating to me is some female. Now, Zula Pogorzelska was married 
to, to Conrad Tom. She was, they were an item, they were an item, then they were married either in 1922 or 1929. And she stayed with Tom and she was in a lot of films and people complained about her being in films because she was always cast as the clown. And, and that was much, that was not Zula. Zula could do all kinds of things. But other female uh, performers who were very, um, extremely good, like, like Ordonka, um, Hanka Ordonovna, she was someone who was in a couple of movies and then she was proclaimed non-photogenic in the press, which was full, yes, it was, it was not right. But nonetheless, um, they, she decided that what she wanted to do, and this is a really bold thing, and it shows you how the cabaret um, encouraged people to develop in different ways. They grew, it was a school in a way, it's an informal school. And she decided that she would become a one woman show. I mean, she would have an orchestra, she would have other people, but she would be a one woman show. And she would have these carefully curated shows of songs that she that were dramatic that she could kind of perform and she changed them according to where she went but she went on tour she was in Berlin she was in Vienna uh, she made a tour to the United States uh, so and she was and then during the war she when she went to try to find her husband in the Soviet Union she was touring in the Soviet Union then she was touring when when they have, she eventually came back to uh, mandate Palestine with the troops. Um, she was performing there. So, so Ordonovna was a one-woman act. Um, and Mirijiminska is very interesting because she toured. She toured a couple of times in the summer with Mitchislav Fogg, um, the great baritone, uh, and she she performed uh, with her husband, who was Tadeusz Sigetinski. Then later, after the war, when it was no longer um, politically correct to be a bourgeois cabaret star, you know, singing about capitalism and commodities and all of that, she and her husband formed uh, Mazovsha, you know, the, the, the folk troupe, which Zimna Voina, the Pavlikovsky film, yes. um, represents and then says, oh, well, they're just happy that they got the advertising. And I thought, you know, you should pay attention to who you may be, not dissing, but condescending to because Mazovsha was a very, very popular and very successful troupe. And she continued to be the director of Mazovsha until her death, until it, until her death. Yeah. Thank you. And Mazovsha is still very popular in Poland now and it's touring around the world and it's coming from time to time, even to New York City. Yes, so, it's good. Uh, it's good. The same with Schlonsk, the other um, folk dance uh, company in Poland. Mm -hmm. um, we have an interesting discussion on the chat uh, uh, with, uh, between a few viewers regarding um, to whom the cabaret and cabaret culture and films, uh, who, was the, who was the audience? Uh, th there is a discussion whether um, uh, this um, uh, was a rural audience, uh, people who lived in the uh, outside of the city, or people who usually moved to the city and they were more educated. So this is like a folk culture uh, versus uh, cabaret and film. So maybe mm -hmm. you can uh, wait it and tell us what is your point on this. Well, I, I admit that I don't know exactly how much I do know that in provincial Poland, and I'm not saying rural places that were, that was truly more like a village, but more like small town Poland, that people, that, that these troops, cabaret troops would, would swing through there and perform and they would perform acts. I don't know how they adapted their acts. They probably changed the topics. They changed some of the material, but they were still sophisticated. The, um, the audiences in Warsaw were both progressive Poles, Polish Christians, and uh, Polish Jews who were acculturated or bicultural. I mean, they may have spoken both Polish and Yiddish. And they're, so, so they are, and they packed these, and they were expensive. It, the cabaret was expensive. So you couldn't just be um, someone who was a working man and decided to go to a cabaret. Now, that changed um, to some extent uh, if, you know, you could you could see lesser cabarets that had their own yadashi, their own um, 
Krukowski their own. I mean, people imitated it and there might be cabarets that were modeled on the big cabarets and were cheaper. But I would say that unless you knew something about politics and about what was going on and you wanted to know more about where, what, what the city was all about, you wouldn't go um, either because of the money or because you might have felt out of place. But there were other, there were other venues people could use. Um, what I really wish is that my colleague Michał Wilczewski was here because he's someone who's written his dissertation about rural Poland and how it interacted with, you know, through the press, how it interacted with what was going on in the rest of Poland. And he has told me that there are cases where, uh, you know, newspapers from the provinces from small towns would say, oh boy, let's talk about Warsaw. And they would show people living high, you know, high on the hog that sort of enjoying the high life and or then they would see stars and those stars who toured were very gracious they were not condescending to small town audiences they wanted people to you know they wanted to deliver their they, they were performers they wanted to perform in front of all sorts of public and they and they were um most of them were they they were not excuse me but they were not snotty they were not snobby so okay um, there is one more question. Uh, so um, just to sum up, so the cabaret for, were, uh, for, was for everyone, for a city and for rural audiences, whoever wanted to come, I understand. You're right. Oh, well, it was probably, it was, you know, the access to it from, from yes. in rural communities was very, very small. I mean, it was, it, 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 it was usually during the summer months when they were um, it was off season in the city, uh, but maybe, but often um, people would say that they would come into town and they would want to go see the cabaret. And that was their one, that, that was the, where they splurged. That's what they did. So, yeah. Sure. And there is a, uh, another question from uh, Galia Dement, uh, which she's- asking... Galia Dement. Hello, Galia. <laughs> yes. Hey, Galia. Um, she has actually two, one question and one uh, common uh, question. Why there were many Jewish performance actors when Jews were actively portrayed, were they still uh, stereotypes? Oh, well, in, in the cabaret, yes. it was usually Jewish writers, I mean, people like uh, acculturated Jewish writers, who would write uh, what were called Schmonze sketches. And the Schmonze sketches, uh, Schmonze sketches had, um, there was a great danger of those being demeaning or uh, um, defaming. But in the, in the best cabarets where the writers were good and all the writers were acculturated Jews who hadn't converted, but, you know, or, or they were bilingual. Um, and we only find that out later on, like someone like Konrad Tom, who was in that movie, he was someone who came from a very middle-class Jewish family. He was supposed to go into banking. Then later on, he got involved in Yiddish language films, but he first wanted to be in, in he wanted to be in what was the big time, which was Polish language. And so they would write schmonces and Tom wrote a lot of schmonces and they were um, genial. They were, they were basically schmonces. Some people theorize that schmonz is the kind of language that was spoken, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't some sort of, you know, this is inferior Polish or whatever, but it was more people who really wanted to be part of the big city and they were marveling at it and they were philosophizing about it and saying, well, that's crazy. And so, and, and many of those people, the, the Jewish performers who were in the Polish language cabaret would go to Yiddish language cabaret to see what they were performing. So, for example, uh, probably the best known pair in Yiddish language cabaret um, was Shimon and uh, uh, wait, Shimon and Zuma, Jumacher. I don't know, I'm mispronouncing it, but they were they were a wonderful. You know, they were the kind of people that when they came on the came onto the stage, people began to clap because they knew what to expect. And that was the same thing with Schmonzes because. Conrad Tom would come on with a bowler hat and glasses down his nose. And he says, oh, I'm, I'm trying to find, you know, the, my, in my genealogy where, where, you know, whether there was any count or whatever. And then somebody else says, oh, you'll never find that. And then they sit down or they're playing chess or they're doing something like this. And for the audience, either it was gratifying for them that they, they were already acculturated, those who were Jews in the audience, or that they were seeing images of their, their parents or their grandparents 
trying to figure out Warsaw, you know, trying to figure out metropolitan Warsaw, you know, why would people have, um, what was it that they had, um, this was, this is actually from the Yiddish language um, cabaret, but they had those, uh, those, those tennis, those, those ping pong paddles, where you would hit a ball that was attached to it on a rubber string. And they'd talk, they'd say, this is a yaya. <laughs> What kind of yayas are these? <laughs> and then they said, we don't know, but this is what people are doing. Why are they playing with yayas? And it goes on and on and on. But it's it's very funny. And that that is a kind of sketch comedy. There was not like bring out um, the Jew who is a mercenary or the Jew who is stereotyped in some way. The person who was most clearly a Jewish character always was Lopek. And he was seen as he was beloved because he was always uh, singing really good songs that basically said, if you can't have what you would like on the silver screen, I always have malcha, my wife at home, and I have, you know, I'll eat whatever she gives me. I may not be able to eat steak, but I'll eat what she eats and, and et cetera. He's basically, he becomes the everyman of Warsaw. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, uh, we will be heading, you know, to uh, to finish up, but there are more questions now. With the, but but uh, you said that Galia Dement had a comment. Did she have a comment? Yeah, the comment is very funny. So I am not sure whether you have the answer. The comment is: Did the ugly dog on the top of the piano in one floor up, I believe, play any particular role in the movie? Oh, it was a goose. Um, it came in, it kept flying all around and, and um, Bodo kept talking to it and he had a fez on and the duck never left. And then all of a sudden the duck disappeared. And I fear that the entire crew ate the duck or like, ate the, the goose, but, but no, the goose was just there to be ridiculous. I mean, this was to make him a screwball guy. So, so yeah, it yeah. was a not, it was not a dog. It was a goose. Okay. It was, a, it was a goose. Yes, it was a goose. And it was, it kept going and it honked constantly in, in the scene, which was very funny. So, and one more question is whether there were many um, uh, film producing company at that time in, in Poland who was producing the film and how many companies uh, there were at the time. I, I can't answer that question, but I would say that studios there were some studios that uh, I think there may have been somebody else needs to answer this question. I, I don't know, but I think that there were about three before maybe companies. Now, uh, Bodo's Urania film only lasted a couple of years because it was very hard to get the money for different films and, and it was hard for him to pay top dollar for this or that. Uh, but But the problem was, again, that they had to go from film to film they couldn't they, and they couldn't get investors to and, and it, this was also the 30s it was a very difficult time it was crisis crisis after crisis in Poland so um so I don't know I should find that out and have the answer the next time I speak very good there is um actually one more comment which uh, might uh um help us to finish up our discussion about how World War uh, changed, uh, Warsaw changed cabaret, and also changed performers because uh, some um, truly joined with German clubs, and others were in underground Polish army. So there right. was also a split between uh, actors and uh, performers. Would you yes. agree with that? Well, I mean, it was. It, yeah, it was. It was. It was a very difficult situation because yeah. uh, when, when the Germans occupied Warsaw and they said, we want a German theater, we want German cabaret, so you need to be in it. Some people said no. And then they worked as waiters or waitresses uh, in, in different cafes, but they were not making the money they used to. Someone like Adolf Dimscha, who was, was somebody who couldn't help performing, um, and he also had four kids and he also had in-laws and he had um, other people in the family he had to support. He played in German sponsored theaters. And then later on, he had his hands slapped and was um, denied playing in Warsaw. I think it was, it was it for 10 years? Yes, or, there was a four Y after yeah, the war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so he was, but nobody said, you, you know, we're going to put you in prison because he was right. Adolf Dimscha. No, uh, but... But, uh, and other people were like, Helena Grosudna was an officer. She was an officer in the underground army, in the home army. 
Uh, and you mentioned the book that I wrote about Warsaw's My Country about Kristina Bierzynska. Kristina Bierzynska was in the same POW camp or close to the same POW camp as Helena Grosuvna. So these women went out. Um, and Maria Gorczynska, the woman in, in um, uh, my husband, she was also in the home army. So these women, I don't know, I don't think Grosuvna played in any German sponsored theater. And somebody like Friedrich Jaroszy, his I know his story very well, that he he came from Austria and he had perfect German. And so the Germans thought of him and 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 Jaroszy, Jaroszy was actually he was in a very, 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 very acculturated Jew. I mean his I mean by I he his mother was Jewish, you know, two or three generations back. And he felt very comfortable um, in, he, he felt comfortable everywhere. He was that kind of showman. But, but what was interesting was that the Nazis thought, because he spoke perfect German and came from Vienna originally, that he was a Reichsdeutsch. And so they, they arrested him and said, you have to start a cabaret because you run a cabaret and you know how to do it. And he was trying to figure out what to do. He, now, of course, a lot of this may be um, mythological, but he apparently made friends with the German guards and said, isn't this terrible? And I'm so sorry, you guys have to do this and be so far away from home. I know exactly how you feel. He was just playing them. And then when he was being shifted from one prison to another, he begged these guards that he needed a haircut. And the only haircut he could get, and I, you know, this may be apocryphal, but the only haircut he could really get was from the Frisier, from the barber in the European hotel, the Hotel Europeski. And so they let him go get his haircut and he fled. He went underground. <laughs> <laughs> and he ended up living partly in the Warsaw ghetto, but he kept moving around. He was underground and he was working for the underground. And he eventually was allied with this woman who was working in the resistance. And so that's what he did during the war. So the war was a life-changing story and life-ending story for many of the performers. Yep. And after the war uh, in 1945, uh, there was uh, no cabaret in Warsaw anymore for a long time. And uh, until even now, there are maybe some clubs. So uh, this part but, of the- but, but if I could interrupt there, that, that Serena, was yes. established by Jerzy Jurandot and Stefania Grodzenska, and they wanted to have a, a kind of quiproquo again because they had both been in the cabaret, and Jurandot was a very good writer, and he was part of, um, he was another person who was schooled in the cabaret, and he hoped that, but they had to make a lot of changes um, for the political climate, and I don't know what happened during the years of high Stalinism to Serena. It still exists, though. Right. So we see the world change after the war, and but we are glad that we could listen to the story from Second Polish Republic and about the films and cabarets. Thank you very much, Professor Beth Holden, and we wish you all the best. And we hope that we can uh, have you as a guest the next time and you will bring us another story. Uh, just tell us by the end what you are working now on and what is the, the next uh, great book or a subject <laughs> <laughs> and thank you director Ivona Korga you're doing a fantastic job running the Pilsudski Institute with all your staff it's really amazing place so thank I you. miss being there I'm sorry but you know the the, the world has changed but we are always welcome and we are open you can come anytime so okay I, so we're okay. waiting for you all as soon best. as as yeah. soon as all the New York airports are open, I'll be there. Yes. Thank <laughs> you again. And okay, tell thank us you. at the end uh, what you are working on uh, now. Now? Um, yes. What is oh, the subject that you are working? Oh, uh, oh, I'm very interested in doing a book on sort of partnered biographies of people who were in the cabaret, and then then those people, and then what happened in film. So oh, it would great. be pre-war cabaret and pre-war yeah. film. And it will be talking about, it's sort of like a Jewish Gentile collaboration because that's what it was. Now, nobody really identified very much as religious in any way, but they did identify as show people. And so they worked together and they produced what I think was the best popular culture in Poland. 
Or Thank maybe you. anywhere. <laughs> um, very good. So we keep the fingers crossed and uh, we say goodbye, good night to everyone. And thank you very much, Professor Holmgren. Thank, thank you. And everybody you. have a good supper. Bye. Yes. Bye. Bye.